Here we have Dr. Tom, who's from Growmore, which is an awesome chemical provider to Monster Gardens. He is also an entomologist and has an extensive history in not just the chemical aspect of mitigating pests, but also from the entomology standpoint. With most of our gardeners in the past, what they would see is a traditional method that we use in agriculture. So they look at really chemical pesticides, um, things that are toxic to humans as well as pets, um, but are used as maybe a broad solution, uh, more of a simplified solution. And what our goal has always been as a retailer is educating folks on the product that they're using to understand all of the values, whether it be good or bad. And what we found is there's always been natural solutions that are pretty darn close, if not better, than a lot of the chemical solutions. Um, some of them being uh, people in greenhouse settings or outdoor settings using beneficial insects, such as uh, predatory spider mites or predatory bugs to uh, affect the garden, but also using oils or uh, soaps. And I know that's your world. Do you mind explaining a little bit of some of the benefits that maybe more indoor gardeners would get from using a natural remedy versus a chemical remedy. Sure, it's really important that we try to pick those products to do this pest management that are safe and selective, meaning that they don't have toxicity to other things around in the environment. And in fact, they're only targeting, in this case, say a spider mite. The way this whole concept works in terms of integrated pest management is these safe and selective materials, which are based upon the concept Mites are on the outside of their body, they have a wax layer. The, the plant itself has that same chemistry and that same wax layer. So what we're using are things like soaps, oils, or very selective detergents, which dissolve the wax layer on the mite and thereby remove it. It dries out once that wax is removed. And, and doesn't damage the plant. Now one would ask the question, if it has the same wax on the mite as it does on the plant, why won't it burn the plant or dry out the plant? And the actual answer to that is it's a therapeutic index idea. A little bit is needed to take the wax off of a tiny mite and a lot is needed to take the wax off of the plant. But you understand inherently you can always burn plants with these materials because of the way that they're working with the so-called mode of action. I see, I see. So there's really a concentration tolerance that is different from the pest versus the plant and, that, and, that, and that's the, the deviation that you get from using that, that product. Um, and so when we're looking at uh, mitigating specifically spider mites are a little more detrimental to the garden than um, say thrips are because you can manage them to a degree and they're not as detrimental to the flower production. What are your thoughts about using a neem oil or a neem derivative um, as a mitigation tool for most pests when done so topically on the plant? What do you, what do you think the, the, the strength is of neem over, over other products? Neem is, a, is an actually, um, you know, obviously it's a botanical extract. The original extracts came from India and when the plant, they do a crude extract of neem, the active ingredient that we recognize as, as entomologists is called azadiractin. Mm -hmm. And that's the active ingredient. And what it is, is it's an insect growth regulator that goes in and it messes up the insect's ability to molt and move through the different growth stages. Because it's an insect growth regulator, it doesn't knock down or kill anything, the azadiractin. It's not a quick, short residual poison that would kill something. Therein, it's a very safe material for people. It's in toothpaste if you're in India and stuff. Neem extracts have been used in a lot of human Yeah, the uh, health food industry. Yeah, health food yeah. into neem. Over the years, it, it's been, when, they make, when you make a heavy oil extract of that particular plant or the neem oil, that oil is not a very plant-friendly material from the phytotoxic perspective. It's a heavy oil. It comes in as an extract and it can burn any kind of soft tissue. Mm -hmm. So as neem has evolved over the last 30 years in our production agriculture and in most of our systems, what you've seen is a movement towards more and more purification of the azadiractin. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's some fantastically good and perfectly isolated, well-defined products now on the market yeah, we've that are, are I, I'm really applauding those guys.
because years ago we were burning crops all over the world with neem oil, crude extracts of neem. Mm -hmm. We're enjoying the benefits on that plant growth regulator side, or excuse me, insect growth regulator side, mm -hmm. but we were they were too hot, too I burning. See. So now you've got a benefit there. So it's a selective material in that it's it's not going to be killing a lot. I mean, it's not a broad spectrum thing that you have mm -hmm. to worry about toxicity to mm -hmm. humans and other stuff. But that not all neem is the same. That's no, no. There again, you've got to go with a really good, clean, really good super clean. clean. Yeah, super clean. I'm not a big fan of neem oil because of phytotoxicity. What? Are, so you brought up soaps and different detergent type sure. uh, soaps. So do you mind describing a little bit of what we were discussing there? Yeah, the key issue with this this idea, I call this whole class of of, um, of pesticides or insecticides, I call them non-selective cuticle disrupting products. The insect cuticle, the insect and the mite, all have again a wax layer. It's a, it's it's designed or was designed in nature to keep the water inside that little arthropod. Okay, plants have that same wax layer. Soap is the concept of a chemistry. If you look at how pioneers made soap, they used to take what was called potash or ashes out of the fireplace, which is potassium hydroxide, mix it with tallow. You now have a potassium extraction of fat. That's what a crude soap is. That process is called soponification. So a potassium salt of a fatty acid, which can come from a plant source as a fat or an animal source as tallow, that's what a soap is. Soap is good at dissolving other soaps when it's mixed with water or, or fat in with water because it's a polar molecule in water. The problem is if you have hard water, which is calcium or bicarbonates in water, soaps make bathtub scum and you, they don't work. Detergents, or what we typically call a dish soap, is really a detergent. It's a fatty alcohol. Mm -hmm. So instead of that potassium hydroxide in there reacted with the fat, alcohol forms with it to make that charged molecule in water. You have a polar and a nonpolar part. The cool thing about detergents is they're much more efficient at dissolving wax or grease off of a plate than soap is. I see. So it's very, very effective, you think, then to dissolve the wax off of a mite. The challenge is you have that therapeutic index again. To the if you're really yeah. good to the plant, you can tend to be more phytotoxic with detergents. Now, there are a number of products that they've figured out the safety mm -hmm. level where you can kill the mite or dissolve the wax layer on the aphid, but without burning the plant. But you're always going to have and that And that would challenge. be like an insecticidal soap, quote unquote, correct? An insecticidal soap or an insecticidal detergent. I see. Yeah. And so Dr. Bronner, Sal said soap, um, and even stylite oil. Um, those have been some products that a lot of our you know gardeners have gotten a hold of from other sides of the industry and have used as an application method for pests. What do you think about those? We just jumped into two categories there. Soaps, Sorry. as yep. we've described, we have soaps now, and you understand detergents versus soaps. Mm -hmm. All of these things follow good quality manufacturers' label recommendations on, on how to use them so that you're safe with your crop because you're using, again, this non-selective cuticle disrupting type of mode of action. There are two kinds of oils in the world. There's vegetable oil, which comes and it's extracted from plants, and there's paraffinic oil, which is synthetic, and it comes out of an oil refinery. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in how they interact with the wax layer on a plant or an insect in, in a crop situation. Vegetable oils tend to smother the insect and stick it to the plant and thereby kill it. Oh, they wow. leave a thick, sticky residue on the plant, mm -hmm. and if you've ever sprayed a lot of them, they're nasty, they're sticky to work with, they get, you know, they're old like, a, it's sort of like painting linseed oil on a closet door, okay, it's a sticky thing, right? Okay, that's, that's a, a vegetable oil. Now, a paraffinic oil, on the other hand, is something that actually chemically reacts with the, with the wax layer just like that detergent did. So the paraffinic or narrow range oils, as we call them, something like Sunspray Ultrafine Oil would be one, GMS Stylet Oil you okay. mentioned, those are very narrow range, meaning they're a small molecule mm -hmm. with carbon chain. They actually dissolve the wax. Therefore, you have the same challenge with phytotoxicity. You have to be careful I with see. those oils. And there's a loophole in organic certification of a National Organic Program material Nothing synthetic is supposed to be used, but we do allow paraffinic oils, even though they come out of the Richmond refinery or someplace like that. Are there any other things that you can think of that you would want to? 
Yeah, I think one of the things on that note, you just were talking about, you you segued a bit into the issue of how you tie this together in terms of a a successful and sustainable production Mm -hmm. operation. And I think a key component of this is a great company like yours providing the information. We understand a lot of these principles. We know how to practically apply integrated production management techniques. We have a whole toolbox of everything from irrigation, input uh, fertilizer, nutrition, water chemistry, lights, air movement, air quality. All of those are IPM in the name goes of integrated production management, but it comes from the knowledge and listening to this kind of input. Well, thank so you. it's critical. Education is critical and we applaud you for your great role in that. Well, thank you. And, and one last piece. Um, I, I love the IPM method and there's always going to be a situation where something breaks down. I mean, that is just business. You know, everything runs perfectly and something happens. And so even if you have the most defined schedule and you hold to it and maybe one of your workers or something happens that's outside of your um, forecasting and you have this issue, it's still okay to have access to some chemical tools, but they're really a last resort type of situation and you definitely have to be mindful of their application and the after effect to the market value. So, um, you know, I definitely want folks to know that it's not like we're completely against chemicals. Well, I guess we are. We are kind of against chemicals um, being used as a pesticide. But it, they, chemical pesticides could still be used in situations where your machine broke down due to mismanagement, though it's a poor um, remedy solution. And if you're going to market with the product, you definitely have to be mindful of if you're able to apply it or not. Um, what, what is your thought about that? Yeah, I, it's I, just a, I look at it as like a tool in the toolbox. It's the tool you want, it's like the fire extinguisher. You have a fire extinguisher in your house, you don't intend to ever use it, right. but if something goes awry because you're mismanagement, you need to grab that fire extinguisher and use it. But again, your house is gonna be burned to crisp, though you would have saved it for burning. There's gonna be an after effect that's that's collateral damage. What is, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, um, I've spent a whole career working on both sides of organic and safe and selective and then conventional pesticides. Pesticides are a very valuable part of our production systems because they are very effective, usually cost effective, and they're often immediate. A lot of these biocontrol things we talk about, they take planning, they take integrating, and they're more difficult to use. The good news in the world is in the last 30 years, or certainly in the last 15 years, you now have a whole toolbox of things that are safe and selective in terms of the toxicity to the environment and the world. Things like organically certified pesticides, like spinosad as I call Mm -hmm, it. mm -hmm. Um, Back in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, we didn't have that. It was the companies, big companies like Siba Geigy and other that made a decision in their corporate world that they were gonna take the danger and warning label pesticides out of the world. No, you're right. There are some there are still some good pesticides out but there. Again, I'm thinking of Re- yeah. Avid or Contos or Judo or, you know, these these, yeah. these typically miticides is right. what we these, see. The the challenge here is it's an education one. Uh, those materials have a place and a fit in the world, but you have to be educated as to their toxicity and what it means. You don't want to be spraying something that has a high mammalian toxicity for wherever your crop's going to end up. And the issue is, we even though there are those safer ones out in the world right now, or those things that are like soaps and oils that we can use that are basically, you know, way, 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 way less toxic than some of those other things, but to the end user, you make a decision when you, you choose a, uh, a tool. Mm-hmm. You need to be an informed consumer mm-hmm. and you don't want to go with toxics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, I'm not opposed to chemistry. All Everything is about chemistry in the world and in animals and in, in plant physiology. Chemistry is our friend. We just want to be knowledgeable and not deal with toxic chemistry. I understand, completely agree. And again, you. toxicity is a matter of dose. It's true. Everything we deal with can uh, be overdone. That's a great amount of information. It really helps to create that 30,000 foot view on how to IPM manage your garden. We thank you so much, Tom, for taking the time with us. And we urge you growers out there to research any of the information that we discussed today, as well as contact us directly for any of the solutions that we might have. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're right. Thank you.